Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Let's see. Okay, I'm just trying to get set up. Um, okay, so uh, as you can know, we're gonna meet like this for probably the rest of the semester. So um, this link here should be the same link for every meeting. I, I the, you know, the way I created the meeting, I hope that this is the same link over and over again for each one of the meetings. So we'll meet uh, every Monday and Wednesday at this time. And then also, if, if, if you have questions and you wanna like meet me for office hours, send me an email. We can always use Zoom or something else to, to uh, communicate together if you have questions about anything, okay? So, uh, does everything seem set up correctly? Anybody have any questions? No. Yeah. Let me... I'm trying to set up my end to try to, I'm not really used to Zoom yet. I'm trying to still get used to the user interface. Okay. Okay. So we're going to talk about fork join some more. Okay, we're going to keep talking about the, the fork join framework. So um, I'm going to, I've do downloaded this zip file that has the, the fork join code in it. And okay. um, well, well, there's two things to do is it explain the fork join framework and also look at a specific code. So we started talking about the framework before spring break, okay? Remember the idea, this is kind of sketchy here in, in um, pseudocode, but you wanna solve some, it, it's based on a lot, is based on the idea of like merge sort. So you, you think merge sort when you think about this. So you have some, you wanna solve some problem. If the size of the problem is small enough, you solve it sequentially. Okay, like in case of merge sort, when the array is small enough, you just sort it with some simple sort. Like you might just go ahead and solve it. If the array is less than 10 units long, you might just do insertion sort or something, okay? So you return the solve sequentially. If the problem is still too large, you're gonna cut it into a left half and a right half. And then you're gonna somehow say in parallel, somebody solves the left half recursively and somebody solves the right half recursively, okay? And then after you get the two left and right half solutions, you have to combine them together, okay? So this turns out to be a way to, to build libraries of parallel programming, okay? Now, here, you know, what do we mean by invoke and parallel? You know, if you've got two CPUs, one CPU can run this and one CPU can run that. But the trouble with that idea is that if you've got two CPUs, what when you get to this one and you recurse, what do you mean by run in parallel again? You know, if, if, you, if you're gonna cut a problem into half and then cut it in half and cut it in half and keep doing that several times, you're gonna end up with two to the N pieces and you can't run them all in parallel if you've got only say four cores, okay? Now you could just essentially think that there's a thread solving this and there's a thread solving that, okay? And that when, when you, this invoke in parallel creates two threads. Like one possibility is invoke in parallel creates a thread to solve this and a thread to solve this. Trouble with that is if you start with an array of size 1 million, and you cut in half, you get two threads, and you cut each half in two, in two halves, you get tw twice as many threads, and you cut those in half, and you get twice as many threads, you're gonna end up with possibly thousands of threads. And that's not a good idea either. So the thing is to figure out a way to make this framework work in an efficient way. You, you can't have, you don't wanna make it so that there's thousands of threads. 
where you took an array and cut it in half and one thread does the left half, one thread does the right half, then you take each half, cut it in half, and then you create a new thread to do half of that. And then we have to create, you, know, you have to keep cutting things in half and creating new threads. Okay, so when we talked last week, the difference between a task and a thread, okay. A, a thread is what we've been talking about with, with P threads. The operating system creates a thread that will run through some code. A task, now we model threads with functions. So essentially a thread is a special kind of function call. What we're gonna do now is have these things called tasks, which are just fun, which are functions just like threads. And the idea is that we map many tasks to one thread. Okay, so we could have the operating system create a thread, but then we have to we want to control the thread, essentially like drive it. We want to drive it through a bunch of tasks so that one thread will do one task after another task after another task. Okay. And that's essentially how we're going to make this make sense is that we're going to have a small number of real threads but we're going to have a large number of tasks and each thread will just start solve each thread will grab a task run it till it's yeah you know, which means it'll call that function the task is a function the thread calls that function when the thread returns from that function the thread doesn't die the thread just gets another task and calls that task. And then when that task returns, the thread grabs another task, okay? And we keep repeating this until there's no more tasks, okay? okay. So um, we, the best way to describe this is with pictures. And one problem is I'm, I'm still tr str struggling with a way to draw pictures uh, on this computer screen. Let's see if I can, um, there's a whiteboard here. Doesn't make it very easy, but okay. So the, 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 you know, we talked last week about what we call thread pools and task pools, okay? So uh, suppose I, have, I can have a thread, let's see. I can have a thread one and a thread two and a thread three, okay? Suppose I have three threads, okay? But then I can give each thread essentially a data structure that'll be its task pool, okay? So I'm gonna think of it as an array, but it's not gonna be an array like an integer array. It's gonna be an array of tasks. So essentially this array are pointers to task objects, okay? so this. It's an array of tasks, okay? So each element in this array points to a task. And a task is a object with, just like a run, tasks are like runnables. They're just objects that hold one method. Okay. So what this thread, this thread, what he's really gonna do is grab that task, call this function, then when that function returns, he'll grab that task, call its function, and then seemingly like this thread will do the same thing. He'll call that task, then he'll call that task, then he'll call, and this guy will be calling this task and this task, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set it up so that our work gets divided up into tasks and the tasks get put into a task pool for every thread, okay? Okay, so every thread's gonna get this kind of collection of things that it's gonna, every thread's like a worker and he's gonna get assigned jobs to do, tasks to do, okay? okay? And the way we're gonna do it is by this recursion thing. So like here's our big array that we wanna do some operation on. Like in the, in the, in the, the notes we've been using as a reference, they look at like just summing this array. Or, or you can find the maximum number in this array, or you can sum this array. If you need to sum all the numbers in this array, okay, and you have more, you, know, you would just cut the array in half, have one thread do this half and one thread do this half. Okay, that, but that's, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna cut the array in half, 
and create a task that does this half. So this is going to be a task. And this task is going to be put into that cube. Okay. Similarly, we're going to cut this guy. We're going to make this guy into a task. We're going to create a task that represents doing that work. Okay. And we're going to put that task, say, in that cube. Okay. So now there's two tasks. This will be task one. This will be task two. Task one is in here, maybe, and task two is in here. So this thread grabs task one, and he sees that it's still too long. So he cuts it in half, and he creates a task. I'll call it task three. And he creates another task, task four, and he puts those into this array. So now maybe task three and task four are over here. And then he waits. Then, then task one waits for task three and four to be complete. So, you know, meanwhile, this guy, he took task two out of his thing and he creates, he cuts it in half because it's still too big. Okay, and this is going to be a task five and a task six. And he puts them in his queue. So he puts task five and six over here. So we had one, task one here, task two here, task three and four here and task five and six here, okay? And then this just keeps on going on. Task three, when he pulls this, when, when he pulls task three out of this queue, he's gonna see that it's too big. He's gonna create a task, let's see, it'll be task uh, seven and eight. And he'll put them, he'll, he'll chop this in half and put two new tasks in this pool. Similarly, he'll be chopping this in half well, no, this one, will, notice that T4 is still, hasn't been pulled out yet. So task three uh, was running and he puts task seven and eight in here, okay? Now, I'm not being careful. The, this task pool here is actually a double-ended queue. You can put things in it on either end here or this end here, okay? And one of the real interesting things about this scheme is who uses which end of this queue, okay? When, when T1 puts a tap, when T1 puts tasks in the queue, he puts them on this end. So T1 would be using this end, okay? And T2, would be using this end of this one. So when he puts tasks in, he puts them in this end. When T1 removes a task, he actually removes it from this end here. I was actually making a mistake. I should have removed them from over here. He removes them from over here. Okay. So for example, when task three put in task four and task seven in the queue, the next task he pulls out of the queue will be uh, seven. Okay, well, actually, let's start over again. Let's, let's start over. Okay, task one goes in here. Task two goes in here. Okay. Task one will, pull, will push three and four into there. And task two will push five and six into there. Then task two has to block because he's waiting on five and six. And task one has to block because he's waiting on uh, three and four. Okay. So when... Task one blocks, this thread has to get something else to do. He doesn't get three. That was a mistake. So he doesn't get three. What he'll get is task three. Let's see. Um, we don't have, let's see, don't have these yet. Okay. Okay. So task one. He split his work into two tasks, three and four. He put three and four into the queue, okay? He put three and four into the queue, okay? When one blocks waiting on three and four, this thread's got to do something, so the thread grabs four out of the queue, okay? He actually grabs four out of the queue, and he'll cut this in half, and he'll create a five. Let's see. I'm in the wrong drawing tool here. He'll create five and six. Okay. Meanwhile, two. Well, it two 
could then create a seven and eight, say. Okay, trans two will create seven and eight. Okay, All right. When task two puts seven and eight in this in uh, in the queue, task two is blocked because he has to wait till seven and eight are done to be able to join them. So then you grab eight, okay? So you'll grab eight, but eight will be cut in half. So you know, that'll create two threat two new tasks that go here and here. Like up here, we have three, four, five, and six. Okay, when six gets pulled out, let's see. Six was actually cutting three and a half. Six was from cutting three and a half, so this was five and six. Okay. All right. So when six gets pulled out and gets cut in half, notice that what's piling up over here are smaller and smaller jobs. On to the right, you're piling up smaller and smaller jobs. Okay. So for example, hmm? So maybe this is nine and ten. Okay, small jobs grow. You when you pull when you get a job out of the queue, you get a job out of the right end of the queue, and you put things into the right end of the queue. So that means you keep putting smaller and smaller and smaller jobs on the right, and the bigger jobs are over on the left. Okay. Um. And I should also, when when job one is taken out of the queue, he's really removed from there. So he's no longer the left edge of the queue. Similarly, two is not there anymore. He's not in the queue. He's actually, you know, task one was removed from the queue and split into three and four. Task two was removed from the queue and split into seven and eight. Okay. Then task three was removed from the queue and split into five and six, okay? And task seven would be removed from the queue and split into say uh, 11 and 12, okay? No, say, so the, the, the when, a, when a task gets removed, it's removed from the queue and you put new threads into the right, okay? But he always grabs threads. He grabs new tasks out of it here. So starting now, for example, he would grab 10 out of there. He would grab this one 10 out. Wherever this 10 was, it would get split into two, and then it would end up being put, pushed back in as 11 and 12. I have a question. Uh-huh. So what is the advantage of doing this recursive route? recursively rather than iteratively. It's easier to write recursive functions. And the recursion takes care of the ordering of these things in a nice way. Um, mostly it's just because it's a lot easier to write recursive functions. Like, you know, think of merge sort. Would you mm -hmm. want to write merge sort as an bunch of for loops no the, see yeah the beauty of mer merge sort is that it's really elegantly written as a recursive function and that's that's kind of what motivates this you know uh if you were to try to do this iteratively you, you would just you wouldn't be using the elegance of of the idea of merge sort you know merge sort says oh if i need to merge this if i need to sort this array I sort the left half, sort the right half, merge them. Oh, I'm done. That's the whole algorithm. Sort the left half, sort the right half, merge them. How do I sort the left half? I cut it in two. Sort the left half, sort the right half, merge them. See, you know, th there's a beauty and an elegance to describing things recursively like that. So the people doing the fork join framework wanted to keep that. Okay. Now, if you want to write it iteratively, it's not fork join anymore. Then, you know, you're, you're, probably just going to have to roll, you know, write a bunch of threads by hand and you don't get you're not going to get the the scheme that's going to work real well okay 
So it, it, it really, the, the answer is that, that, that recursion is a nice way to describe divide and conquer algorithms. Instead, like over here, instead of doing a sort, I'm, suppose I want to sum this array. You know, how do I sum an array? Well, find the sum of the left half, find the sum of the right half, and add the two numbers. Okay, and that's the whole algorithm. So then, well, how do you find the sum of the left half? Well, you take the left half, divide it into two halves, find the sum of the left half, find the sum of the right half, add the two answers, and return them to the person who called you. Yeah. So recursion makes it real easy to describe an algorithm. And then what the recursion does is it keeps chopping the algorithm into smaller and smaller. Oh, actually, actually, here's another th good question. Yeah. Here were the, okay, here's another, in the book, he actually, in that, uh, in that book on uh, the sophomore parallelism, he kind of talks about this in the following way. If you want us, if you want to, sum up an array, okay, and you have four cores, it's real easy to sum an array with four cores. Divide the array into four pieces and divide the array into four equal size pieces, write a for loop that sums one quarter of the array, write another for loop that sums another quarter of the array, write another for loop that sums another quarter of the array, and run each of those four loops in three in four threads, right? So that's the iterative solution, okay? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with saying, okay, I got four cores, chop the array into four pieces, okay, and just let each thread run on one core and do one fourth of the work? Mm, nothing that I can think of. Uh, okay, scale. It doesn't mm. scale. What does that mean? If you put it on a machine with more cores it's not going to utilize right them. it's not it's not it'll grow to, it'll now here's the word scaling is thrown around a lot i could say well if you change the array from 1 million to 2 million it works fine if you change the array from 2 million to 4 million it works fine so it scales in the size of the array but it doesn't scale in the number of cpus if you give me a machine with eight cpus i'm still stuck with code that only uses four of them okay so now I write my program a little bit more cleverly. When the program starts up, it asks the operating system how many cores there are, sets that to an integer n, then it takes the array and cuts it up into n pieces and creates n threads, where n is the number of cores. Okay, so now it's iterative still. Okay, it's still iterative and it scales. So like your question is like, what's, why do all this recursion stuff? Because now I've solved the scaling problem. I just, I just have to ask the operating system at the start, how many cores are there? I, that's a number N. I have to write a little bit more complicated program. Now it has to chop the array into N pieces, create N threads, and give each thread one nth of the array. But now that scales beautifully. There's still something a little bit wrong with it. We mentioned it in class. It's got, it doesn't have a scaling problem now. It's got a different problem. It's got a load balancing problem. Do you remember what mm. we mean? It's got a load balancing problem. You may have a, a hardware threads that sit idle when you f towards the end of the runtime. Yeah, because if it's certain it, threads might finish faster. Yeah, than others. exactly. So you've got eight <clears throat> threads and you've chopped the array into eight pieces, but it could be that two of those pieces finish super fast or faster than the other six. So now two cores are just sitting going, you know, I'm done and, and being real lazy and not helping the other cores that are working hard. So that's called load balancing. That's actually the problem that this, iter this recursive scheme helps solve, okay? So the scaling problem, you're right, we could do that iteratively, okay? The, okay, now let's think about how you'd solve the, the, the load balancing problem if you were doing this really iteratively. So here's what you do, okay? When you start up, instead of asking the operating system how many cores you have, you just say, I'm gonna chop the array up into a thousand pieces, okay? 
I'm going to chop the array up into a thousand pieces and launch 1,000 threads. Okay. And then those, that 1,000 pieces are, they're, they're not, none of them are very big. So it's a lot of little jobs. And if one thread finishes its job, it'll, this operating system will just schedule it to keep working on other threads. You know, so the, so the operating system, now there's a thousand threads, a thousand little pieces of work to do, and the operating system will make sure that there's uh, threads running all the time. So until you get to the where there's only, suppose you have eight threads, you'll always have eight threads working until there's only less than eight pieces left. Yeah. So as long as there's more than eight pieces left to do, you'll have eight threads running. So now you have very good load balancing. It's still iterative. You're, you're just, yeah, you take the array, chop it into a thousand pieces, create a thousand threads, and just dump those threads on the operating system and let it schedule them. You run into unnecessary overhead from task switching. Right. Now you've overburdened the operating system. You've tried to come up with little pieces of work so that there would be better load balancing, but you've inadvertently created too many threads. Okay. So the solution is. You need, to chop the you need to chop the job into little pieces of work, but you can't create a thread for every little piece of work. So you want a scheme that creates little pieces of work. Well, for us, that's the divide and conquer idea. The divide and conquer idea keeps recursively chopping our program down into smaller and smaller pieces of work. And then the thread pool idea over here is what's going to stop it we're not going to create a thousand we're not going to create a thread for every one of these little tasks every one of these little tasks is just going to be put in a, th a task pool and there's only going to be one thread per task pool and they'll instead of having the operating system schedule threads we will ourselves say well you grab a task out of this thread pool do the task then grab another one do it then grab another one and do it okay so the, the, the final answer is that if you're going to do this iteratively, if you don't do load balancing, then you have like, you know, N tasks on N CPUs, but they, you know, some of them might halt because they're done with their work and then there's they're empty CPUs. If you cut your work into lots of little pieces so that there's always, you know, it's a lot easier to keep all the CPUs running but then you end up with too much overhead of context switching where the operating system has to try to schedule between. See, unfortunately, the operating system is not going to be smart enough to say, there's a thousand thread here. Let me only run eight of them and kind of like push 992 of them to the side and just let eight of them run. And then when those eight are done, then I'll grab eight more and let them run. Then when those eight are done, you can't tell an operating system to do it that way. That would actually be the most efficient way. That's actually what this scheme more or less does. So operating systems don't have an explicit concept of thread pools. No, no, they they treat all threads as equal, except for pri you know, uh, except for the notion of a priority. But you know, you don't want to create thousands of threads and then start assigning priorities to them. You know, first of all, there aren't going to be hundreds of priority levels. There's only like ten priority levels. Yeah, so the operating system basically just says all threads are created equal. So they get the, they have, it's a round robin scheduler. Yeah, so if there's a thousand threads, you run thread one, then thread two, then thread three, then thread four. You know, you give every thread a turn before you return back to thread one. And, you know, you do round robin scheduling. That's how Windows and Linux schedule. So if there's a thousand threads, all 1,000 threads get a turn before you can go back to the uh, first thread. Okay, and we don't, we, what you really want to do is just say, let thread one finish. Then when thread one's finished, then someone else can get the CPU. Then let that thread finish. Don't context switch. Just let that thread finish until, but the operating system won't do that. But that's what we're going to do here. We're going to set it up so that when this thread pulls a task out of that thread queue, it'll finish that task. It won't pull another task out of that task pool until it's finished the one it pulled out before. So that thread essentially will just, it won't interrupt itself. It'll just finish whatever it started until, and, and, and then when, it, when it's finished with whatever started, then it goes, grabs another task. Okay. That ends up giving us real good load balancing, 
and and very little overhead of threat of thread scheduling. So the load balancing actually turns out to be probably the biggest goal of this. Okay, the 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 load balancing, the idea that you got to chop this thing up into lots of little pieces, so that you can fit little pieces on. You know, that th there's always a little bit of work for some thread to do. Yeah, if some thread finishes what he's doing, there's always going to be some little bit of work to do because you've chopped the work into so many small pieces, there's always more to, small pieces. If you only have a few big pieces, then you're stuck with him doing a big piece, him doing a big piece, him doing a big piece. When a big piece is over with, there may not be a big piece left for a CPU, so it just sits there idle while, like, while other CPUs are doing big pieces. So you don't want to schedule big chunks of work. You want to schedule little chunks of work. But the beauty here is you'll schedule a big chunk of work like this whole, like this is half the array. It was one chunk of work. But since we're going to do recursive divide and conquer, when you give the, this, uh, when you give, when your task is to do this big chunk of work, the task just says, oh, I'm going to cut it in half and create two new tasks. So when our task is to do a big chunk of work, the, the, the solution is to just chop the task into two smaller pieces and, and create two new tasks and put them in the task pool. At some point, when the task is small enough, there's this thing called the sequential threshold. When you hit the sequential threshold, then the task is small enough that the, that the task is to do the work. If it's, if it's sorting an array, and if your threshold is 100 and your array finally gets to be size 100, you sort it, say, with insertion sort. If your, ta if your job is to sum the array, when the array hits 100, you just add up, you just do an iterative for loop that it iterates through the array and adds up the 100 numbers in the array. So you end up with this sequential cutoff that says, oh, when the task is finally what we think of as a small task that's not worth cutting up anymore, then we just do that task, okay? So, the strategy is you're going to have big tasks at this end of the thread at the work pool, and you'll have you'll keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller tasks at the at the little end. Okay, eventually the tasks that down here are little or enough that they're actually being finished. Then you kind of go back up the thread pool and you get back to where you started. Okay. Okay. Now there there is we'll, we'll talk about this in detail a little bit later. But there is the idea that one of these thread pools could empty out while another thread pool still uh, th got work to do. Okay. One of the tricks of this scheme is that if one thread pool empties, like here's a completely empty thread pool. Okay. When a thread pool empties, it needs a job to do. So when a thread pool is empty, it should reach into somebody else's thread pool and grab a work job. Now remember, the thread pools have bigger jobs on the left, smaller jobs on the right. If he's got nothing to do, what's a better thing for him to go grab? Okay. He's a worker with nothing to do. What would be a better strategy for him to grab? What if he grabs grab from a someone else's thread pool? Okay. What if he grabs a little job on this end of the thread pool? All right. Then he completes that real fast, right? So then, what's he got to do? Grab another from somebody else's thread pool. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he'll finish that. If he grabs it from this end, he'll finish it real fast. Because remember, at this end are little jobs. So maybe he should grab it from the left end in order to avoid starvation of another thread? No. Okay. He should grab. He, okay. If he grabs the threads, if he grabs the jobs from this end, he's grabbing little jobs. So that means he has to go back and grab them real often. He's going to start blocking this guy from using that end of his own queue. Mm -hmm. Remember, he's also putting things into this end of the queue. So this guy is putting new tasks in this end of the queue. If he's taking tasks out of this end of the queue, they're fighting for that end of the queue. And also, he's going to be constantly going back over there over and over again. So that's doubly inefficient. He's, 
he's going here and fighting with him. He's trying to put things in this end while he's trying to take things out of that end. Plus, he's grabbing little things, so he finishes them real quickly, so he's back here again. What he should do is go to this end of the queue and grab a big thing. So that's doubly good. Since he grabs a big thing and pulls it down here, he's got work to do. He's not going to get... See, remember, four is a big array here that hasn't been subdivided yet. If he grabs a big thing from this end, he's got work to do. He'll, he'll actually keep himself busy for a while. Plus, since he grabbed it from this end, he's not fighting with him who's, over, who's possibly putting things on this end. So this double-ended queue, we want to eliminate what's called contention in the queue. We don't want two threads fighting over this end of the queue. This guy's putting his new jobs into this end of the queue. Whenever he cuts a job up into two pieces, he puts the new pieces in this end of the queue. So he doesn't want this guy stealing from this end of the queue because then they're fighting over that same end of the queue. On the other hand, if we design the queue carefully so that this end of the queue is independent of this end of the queue, he can steal from this end of the queue and steal a big job. So he'll steal, for example, he'll steal four. And he'll steal four and put it over here okay well four was this kind of semi big chunk so now he gets to work on four he'll he'll take four out of the queue yeah he'll take four out of the queue but it'll need to be subdivided so then he'll immediately put two subdivisions and maybe he'll be ta maybe this will be task 100 and task 101 which would be the two pieces that are uh the halves of this guy okay then he'll take 101 out yeah but see now he's got a lot of work because he's got to eventually do all the work on that kind of big piece so when one of these guys runs out of work if if he should ever run out of work he'll grab something kind of big out of the left end of one of these guys queued this is called the work stealing aspect of this when a when one thread is has no more work he steals from the left end of another thread's work queue. By stealing from the left end, he steals big jobs. And by stealing from the left end, he's not contending with the right end where that thread is putting his new little jobs. Okay. And then once he's stolen a big job and put it over here, it's going to take him a while to finish that big job. Okay. That's the load balancing. That's part of the load. The, the load balancing works in two ways. The load balancing is because these are there's, there's the load balancing is because of the little jobs over here, and also because you steal big jobs over here to this thread pool if a thread pool ever empties. Sometimes thread pools never empty. Yeah, it, it might be that your the thread pools are more or less all taking the same amount of time, but this scheme works really well if somehow one of the thread pools is just lucky, gets all his work done real quickly. He'll steal a, a big job out of one of the other thread pools because he always steals from the left end. He'll always steal a big job and then he'll have plenty of work to do. Okay, great. So let's look at the code of this because you know, we've been describing, you know, the, the key is a task is always going to be divide and conquer until it gets to be small enough, in which case you actually do it. Okay, so let me go back to... Um, the code. Uh, let's see where there it is. Okay. Let's now let's go from the pseudo code to the code from that uh, book, the the sophomore introduction to uh, fork join. Okay. Here's one of his first examples. Okay. The idea is to sum an array, okay? So let's kind of look at the, the, uh, the sketch of it first, okay? This is a, okay, recursive action is one of the tasks. So it's, now they keep mixing up words. They have tasks, jobs, actions. Okay, so here they called it recursive action. I don't know why they didn't call it recursive task. So an action is a task, something you want to do. And by nature, this thing is recursive. So 
it, we, it's a recursive action. Okay, so this sum array extends the. Re, now, this is very much. Like, it's essentially like creating a thread. Yeah, you know, it's but instead of extending the thread class, we extend this recursive action class. Okay, the recursive action class has a method. Like remember, a thread has a run method. A recursive action has a compute method. Okay, the key is it's got a compute method. It's a class that holds only one method, just like a thread only holds one runnable thing. This, and a thread holds a runnable and a runnable holds a run method. A recursive action holds a compute method, okay? In our case, compute is gonna compute the sum of an array, okay? So we have a constructor that takes a reference to the array and the left and right bounds that it's supposed to sum between. So this guy's, this action is responsible for summing that array between that left index, that lower index and that higher index. So L and H are the lower index and the higher index, okay? So the object remembers what its low index is, remember what its high index is, it remembers what array it's working with, and it's gonna compute an answer, which initially is zero, and then the answer is going to be the sum of the array. Okay. All right. Suppose now notice you instantiate the constructor will instantiate one of these tasks. Because the idea is that you create the task and then shove it in a work queue. So you have to be able to create the task with a constructor, but the task won't be computed till somebody pulls it out of a work queue. Okay. So he, this is the constructor for creating the task. The task has that state. And then at some point, somebody's going to call the compute method and say, oh, do your work now. Okay. So the, the task has state, and then the task has an ability to compute. Now, when it's asked to do its calculation, here's what it does. It first asks, am I small enough yet? Is the length of the part I have to sum less than the sequential cutoff. Okay, so if I'm a small task, you know, I've been told to sum up a small part of an array, here's the for loop that just does it. On the other hand, if this task is not yet small enough, it's gonna do, it's gonna create two new, now notice that it's gonna create two new objects. Each object is an instance of some array. Notice that this is a weird kind of recursion. The recursion here is an object creating instances of itself. So an object of one class creating two instances of objects of the same class. That's not actually recursion. It looks kind of recursive, but it's not. You have an object of this class that when it calls this function, it creates two new objects of that same class. Okay, Kind of looks recursive, but it's not. This object represents summing the left half of the array. This object represents summing the right half of the array. Okay, so now I've got two, two tasks. What am I supposed to do with them? Well, we know that they should be shoved into the task pool. Okay, so here's how, now here's the mechanism for shoving them in the task pool. On one of them, pardon me? Okay, on one of them you call fork. That puts it in the task pool. Now, fork, usually you think of, oh, that means I create a new thread. It doesn't here. They, they called it fork to be evocative of the idea that you're supposed to execute this left half of the task. But what it really does is it shoves it in the task pool. It doesn't create a new thread. It just says this job, this job here, the one that's left, he should go in the task pool so that somebody can execute him later on. Okay, so he gets put into the task queue. Now, the right half, the interesting thing is, the right half isn't put into the task queue. We call the recursive compute method directly on the right one. That's kind of a clever little trick. You know, we're in the middle of doing this task We've created two new subtasks. We put one of them into the task pool. 
Now, instead of putting the other one in the task pool and then immediately pulling it out, which would be a waste of time, why shove it in the task pool just to pull it back out again? We just go ahead and do it. So it's, it's an interesting little uh, pattern. You put the left half in the task pool. You, lo logically, you'd put the right half in the task pool too, but you're just gonna pull it right back out again. So you go ahead and compute it. Now, when this thing returns, you've done the right, you, this is done, but you, this guy's in the task pool, so you have to join him. You have to wait for him. You have to wait for somebody to have finished doing him. If you wanted to, you could fork the left and fork the right, join the left and join the right. It would be correct. It would just be a tiny bit slower, okay? So you could fork the left, which means put the left half work in the, in the task pool. You could fork the right, which would put the right half work in the task pool. But then you have to wait for the left to be done. You'd have to wait for the right to be done. Then you could combine the answers. But people figured out that it's a lot more clever to put the left half in the, in the fork joint, in the task pool. Go ahead and jump straight into the right half. Just go ahead and just call that compute method, okay? When it returns, eventually, now, you know, eventually it's gonna do a lot of more forking and joining itself, but when it returns, it's done its work, okay? But then you don't know when, you know, you don't know when this guy will be done because he's, he's, you know, he was shoved into the task pool. You don't know when someone's gonna get him out, so you just have to join him, okay? And then when this guy, returns from join, now you've got your left answer and your right answer, okay? Which are just these fields in here, okay? Notice that there's no return method here. Notice that you're not returning, see this is a void function, okay? You're not returning anything. Uh, the answer is just sitting in this object, okay? There, there is no sense of returning an answer when you finish compute, the answer is sitting in that field. When compute returns, when, when compute exits, the answer is in this thing here, okay? So when compute returns from right, the answer is in right.answer, but you have to join left to wait till that answer is ready, okay? All right, so now how do you get this stuff going? This is what gets put into the task queue. These are the tasks, okay? Who, how do you get this stuff all going? Okay. Okay, let's go to the main method and look at the main method, okay? We wanna create a, we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a big array called numbers of size, okay, 100 million, okay, so it's a, we're gonna create a, a, a pretty big size array, 100 million ints, okay, and then we wanna sum the numbers in that array, okay? We're gonna fill the array with random numbers, so fill the array with random numbers. We're gonna wanna time ourselves, so we need some variables for doing timing, okay? This is the final result we wanna compute. In some array, we have that, remember we have this field here decides what's the cutoff. At what point do we stop doing recursive? At what point do we stop recursing and go straight to sequential? Notice I gave it an initial value here, but if I want to, I can override. If I want to, I can override that value, okay? So here I'm overriding it, okay? So over here, it'll set to 1,000. But down here, I say, no, I'm gonna change it to 5,000. But you can play around with that number. So you can change that sequential setup. Right now, the sequential setup is 5,000. The array starts out as 100 million, okay? So there's a lot of 5,000 pieces there. So it's still gonna get cut up into lots of pieces, okay? Do some bookkeeping to keep track of, uh, well, do our start time, set up our start time. Here's where we actually do the fork joining. This starts the fork join process. And then 
So this is a, the thing that does fork join. And then here's where we stop the timing. So start the timing, call fork join, start, stop the timing, get the answer, figure out how long it took, print out some stuff. And then down here, I do a sequential solution of the problem just to have by comparison, you know, how much faster was fork join than doing things sequential. So sequentially just iterates through the array from zero to the length of the array, adding up everything in the array. So there's just a sequential solution. And believe it or not, the sequential solution most of the time is faster than the fork join solution. So I'm still trying to figure out why that is. Okay, but we'll, we'll run it and we'll see what happens. Okay, so what is over, now this is the thing that does the fork join. Okay. Okay, so this is kind of just a, a, a holding class to hold some, to, to, to hold some code that starts the fork join process. Okay, so sum is a static method in this C class. It starts off by creating, uh, okay, we're going to sum this array, okay? So we call the sum method with an array, okay? It creates a big task. So notice it creates a task that's essentially the whole array. So it creates a huge task that says sum this array from its first index up to its last index, okay? So, and we call that T for task, okay? So we create this big initial task. Here's how you start the whole process. You take that task, you call the invoke method on common pool in the fork join pool class, okay? All right, now notice I've got two different versions of this. There was one way to do it back in Java 7 and you still see people reference it a lot. This is the more, more uh, common way to do it. Okay, so nowadays people would just do this one line of code, but it used to be you had to do that line of code and then this line of code. So I still have the both the old way and the new way of doing it in here. Okay, so in the fork join pool, in the fork join pool class, there's a static method called common pool to just build you a, builds the work queues. This is the guy who's responsible for asking the operating system, how many cores are there? If you're on a four core system, this thing will build four work queues. If you're on an eight core system, this thing will build eight work queues. So this is the one that knows how to do the, asking the operating system, how many cores are there? And it builds a work queue for each one of those. Then what it does is it invokes it, it has to, okay, we have to put the initial task in one of the work queues, okay? Suppose we have eight cores, okay? We only have one task to begin with. That one task is put in one of the work queues. Oh, what's up, Andrew? Um, what about tasks that are not CPU bound, but IO bound? How do oh, we you can't do balance that this. those? Oh, this is... Yeah, this has got nothing to do with that. Okay. This is a framework for only doing CPU bound th stuff. Yeah, th this is, uh, you couldn't write out, yeah, this is not something you use for writing a web app. This is not something you do for doing uh, IO multiple, yeah. This is very much a compute bound framework. So this is something you would use like in image processing or uh, data analysis. Uh, so it, 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 yeah, it's very much a CPU bound framework. It, it, it has, I don't, I don't remember ever seeing anybody doing anything that's even using any IO at all with this kind of framework. Okay, so it, it's very much like what we're talking about, like summing an array, applying a filter to an image, uh, searching a string, of, you know, searching uh, text for uh, substrings, very much compute bound uh, task. Okay, and and that's one of the things about uh, parallel programming is, yeah, there's, yeah, there are whole parts of it that are only compute bound things. There are whole parts of it that are only I/O bound things. 
And then there's parts that try to do a combination of I.O. and compute bound together. Yep. Last week, we were talking about trying to do things that were more I.O. bound. You know, when we were talking about using uh, events and polling and threads, we were looking at doing I.O. bound, interleaving I.O. bound tasks. Now we're really switch gears to looking at interleaving nothing but compute bound things. Andrew, how did you raise your hand? Is there, where is that? There is an actual button. So if you're not in full screen mode, there is on the right hand column, a raise hand button. Probably you guys see it and I don't cause I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, like the mom, yeah. Cause I can't, let's see. Yeah. I don't have a raise hand button. It's kind of used. That's kind of neat. Uh huh. Yeah, it puts a little mm -hmm. pop up on my desktop that just says raise hand and has your name. Yeah, so it has the name of who raised their hand and a little little hand symbol. If you click on participants, you will see an option on the right side, bottom of the pop up. Say again. If you click on participants, you will see the raise hand option. Mm -hmm. If I do what? If you're a participant, you'll oh, be able yeah, to see but, it on the yeah, right-hand yeah, side. Yeah, I don't see it because I'm not a participant. But that's actually, it's good to know. I might, I, I can point out to my other classes that there is a raise. Because mm -hmm. I asked one of my classes, I asked them, is there a way for you guys to raise your hand and let me know you have a question? And nobody answered. So I don't know if they, they may not have noticed that button. I didn't notice it in the last class because I had the system in full screen mode. So it literally just didn't show. Boy, that's kind of dumb interface. So when you, so when you didn't maximize it, then you saw something that you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. But the, yeah, that. What else? Any other interesting buttons? Um, there's a group chat. <laughs> there's yeah. that. Yeah, I. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, there's a group chat. Uh, that's good. Um, I don't even remember how to get. Yeah, okay. But okay, so now here's the okay. The the thing that gets the ball rolling is you've got this one big task and it's put in one of the work queues. Now notice that that leaps suppose you have eight cores. That's one work queue's got a big task and seven work work queues got nothing in them. Okay, can you think what happens? Can you see what's gonna happen now? There's eight work queues. One of them's got a big task in it. Um, the invoke function might split it up iteratively into eight chunks. No, no, no. Invoke, no. All invoke does is it places that one big task into the, one of the work queues. That's all he does. Um, then the other guys might start work stealing. Right. That's the key. So, okay. So invoke puts the big task into one guy's work queue. He pulls it out and he immediately cuts it into two pieces and puts those two pieces in his work queue. Another thread immediately steals one of those pieces, okay? Then remember that guy, the guy, he, he, he put one of his pieces in his work queue and he did immediately call compute on the other one. See like, suppose this is, suppose we're up here on the really super big piece. So we take the super big piece and cut it into two half super big pieces. One half is put into the work pool. It immediately gets stolen by somebody else. And then we compute on the second half. Now, so now we've got one guy working on one half and the other half got stolen by two. Now, what about the other six cores? What happened? So now we got two cores working. What happens to the other six cores? Um, those two cores are, that have work are going to fork their tasks and then two others will be able to steal some work. Right. And, and you're going to have this little cascade. Initially, the work stealing is how the work gets parceled out. So initially, you have to have work stealing just to get this process going. So initially, you have one big job in one worker's queue. He pulls it out, cuts it in half, puts one half in his queue somebody immediately steals it. That person who stole it, cuts it in half, puts half in his queue. Somebody steals that right away. So now you got three threads that have got work to do. And then this kind of cascades until everybody's got something to do. Okay. 
And so, so the, the, the ball gets rolling. I mean, it's a really clever kind of thing. The ball gets rolling entirely by work stealing. Even though work stealing was meant to be a load balancing thing at the end, it turns out to also be the way you actually get load balancing at the beginning too. Now it could very well be after that initial work stealing that there never is any more work stealing. If the work happens to be very nicely balanced between all the different threads, it could be that they never really need to do any more work stealing. But initially, the, the way the work gets parceled out is by work stealing. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and, and run this. If I, here, I can compile it and I can run it. Okay. And you get the really disappointing result that Okay, oh, oh, here's a real, here's real interesting. Notice that the fork join sum and the sequential sum don't agree, okay? Oh. A bug in the program. And it's kind of a subtle one, okay? What we're doing is adding up all the numbers in an array. But there's a huge number. To make this interesting, the array is huge, right? What should you be worried about if you're adding up a huge number of numbers? Overflow. Yes. So what I'm doing is I'm randomly generating numbers between 0 and 50. That's too big. Watch. If I cut this down to 40, run it, compile it, run it. It might work fine. And it yep. did. Yeah. So if I create 100 million numbers between 0 and 40, I can add them up. As a long, notice I'm even using a long as the result. The, the result is a long, but because we're adding up so many numbers, they have to be kind of small. So it turned out that if they were size 50, if, they were, if the random numbers between zero and 50, you overflowed, okay? And once you overflowed, you know, there was no reason to think that the parallel and the sequential one would give you the same answers because the overflows were just happening all over the place, okay? So there's, that's one thing that's kind of interesting that when you start doing these test cases, you have to be a little bit careful. You know, in this case, I, you know, by keeping the numbers that we're adding up small enough that we're not going to overflow. The other thing that's kind of disappointing is fork join. Oh, fork join was faster this time. Oh, just a little, okay. Thus, Fork join solution time was 59 and the sequential solution time was 74. So fork join was a little bit faster. Okay, so before I was getting, I was getting faster sequentials than fork join, but this time, now let me make this array bigger. Now, as the array gets bigger, the fork join process will get uh, better and better at this. So like this is an array of 100 million numbers. Now let me go to 200 million numbers. Now I may have to make the integer smaller because now I may be back to having an overflow problem. Um, you almost certainly will. Yep, and I did have an overflow problem. So make the numbers smaller. So let's let's just cut them down to like tw uh, 20, okay? Okay, so the numbers agreed. The fork join sum and the sequential sum agreed. And fork join was slower this time. Um, you might have a problem with your minimum problem size. A thousand seems kind of small. Right. Yeah. So let's. So that's where you kind of experiment with this stuff. So let's maybe because what would be wrong with having too small the small size? Um, the amount of time that it takes to construct a thread and get it running would dwarf but, the no, amount of time not, it takes. No. They're not, remember, there's only, a, the, there's only as many threads as there are cores. Mm. But they still have to construct all those dinky, there's lots of little tasks to create. So let's try, yeah, let's try. So you, 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 I, it isn't, it may not be the creation of the threads, because we're not creating threads, but we are creating tasks. So we have mm -hmm. to create these sum array tasks. So maybe we're creating too many of them. So let's make the sequential cutoff. Is there a way to automatically tune that value? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like as, it, is... as it's running, it sees that, oh, th it's taking less time to actually run the task than it is to construct 
the task. You know, I should I, increase my problem size. I've never seen that done. I don't know if that could be done dynamically. You know, that, yeah, because you, uh, you want the sequential cutoff time to be much larger than it takes to just, yeah. If, if, if it takes longer to create these objects than it takes to compute them, then it's a real waste of time. So you're right. Mm -hmm. you, you, I don't know. I've never seen anybody do that. So let's and, see. Our, our sequential cutoff time is 5,000. Well, let's try it. Double it. 10,000. Okay. So let's try a sequential cutoff of 10,000. Yeah, now now it's substantially different. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> Considering that this machine's got twelve cores, the fact that I went from one hundred twenty-five milliseconds to ninety-three doesn't mean like yeah. You know, <laughs> this machine it, it it's got uh well it's got six cores, twelve of them you know twelve logical cores, but it's got six cores. You should get a speed up of a factor of six. Yeah, and I don't know why the speed up is so lame. Yeah, you know, the speed up is maybe what. 20 30 percent only not a factor of six the original problem size then might be too small to see right. the difference so now you can right so maybe it's a, it, the problem size needs to be bigger but now we start running into problems if we make the problem size too big we start having problems with over with overflow let's try making mm -hmm. the problem size a little bit bigger let's go up to 300 million you might want to switch from ints to longs where um for your accumulator no, it is long. Wait. Um, Shouldn't long be a 64-bit value? Oh, these were. Oh, these should be longs. Yeah. Yeah. These. Yeah, I had. I had the final result as a long, but I should probably be making these longs also because now, if well, the cutoffs are. Um. Yeah, the answer should be a long. Mm-hmm. And from that point, you shouldn't have too many issues of yeah. overflow. Uh, let's see. Here, think about it. Now I have to change the type somewhere. I, my answer is a long. Um, could it be in oh. your summation? Long, no, the return type is long here. Mm -hmm. There. Okay. So I have to return. I have to return a long here. Okay. Not much, see, not that much speed up. Even though six cores, you know, see, parallel, see, oh, here's a little bit of information. Notice that parallelism is 11. It used 11 of my 12 cores. Okay. Uh, here's the, see, it tells you how many steals happen. Altogether, there are only 87 steals. Even though there were probably millions of tasks, only 80, there were, and a lot of those steals were probably at the beginning. Okay. So they, they give you a little bit of information here you know, if, about the fork join pool. It's, I don't have, I don't know right offhand why the speed up is not very good. Um, um, let's see, you can watch the, you can watch it in the task manager. And see, they, first of all, they're not even running for very long. Yeah, that, uh, that may be the issue. It takes longer oh, you know to what else? construct the thread pools than it does to take. No, no, I'm, I just realized something. Look at my task manager. Oh, now I know what's going on. Stupid me. Somebody else figure it out. Look you at my task manager. You definitely have something running in the background. And guess what? What is it? Video chats. We're running a video client. Is your video client really taking 25% of your CPU? It very well could be. I mean, I don't know how well written Zoom is. Um, mine's only chewing up 5 to 6%. But maybe because I'm the leader of it. See, remember, I've got, you know, do you see all the other, you see all your classmates? Do you guys see each other? Um, you're the only one running video. Yeah, I mean, I actually... Right, so I see a blank screen for all of you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, but um, hmm. 
No, but I'm, I, I bet what's screwing this all up is the fact that on all, you know, there's a lot going on on these cores. Because, yeah, I'm using up 25% of my CPU time is already going to uh, probably to uh, Zoom. Huh. I'll have to, I'll do some experiment. Maybe after, you know, this is done. I don't, it might not be that. It might not, it might be something else. There might just be something else that's keeping this from being, uh, I mean, with, with six cores summing an array, this is trivially parallelizable. It should end up being at least two or three times faster with six cores. I, I wouldn't expect it to be six times faster, but I sure would expect it to be at least two or three times faster. Instead, it's only about 20% faster. I could try doing a huge array, but then I'll probably get overflows. Let's see. Now, if I want... Um, you shouldn't get overflows anymore. Let's see. Because okay. you've switched from int to long. You might get an um, out of memory error. Yeah, I created a batch file to, to deal with that. I didn't. Okay, fork join starting to move ahead. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's now it's starting to, to be, yeah, there was a, a good 30% faster. Let's uh, bump up the size. I don't know how big I can go, but I did create a, a batch file to be able to go far, to, to be able to go. Ah, see, now I ran out of memory. So, uh, Okay, that'll run with a big heap. Um, oh, there it is. So there, there it's running with a big heap. Wow, even on a huge seat, even on a huge job, fork join wasn't that much faster. No overflow, got the same answer both ways. Let me try one more. That's really big. Run it with a big heap. Oh, you know this program takes a while to run. You know what most of the runtime is? Most of the runtime is generating the random numbers to fill the array. Mm. It actually spends way more time filling the array with random numbers than it does to, to, to uh, add them up. You might want to then filter that out. It's not, part of the, it's not part of these run times. Oh. Well, it's not, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, that, it's that long pause before you see this output. That's the, uh, that's it filling the array with random numbers. So 400 versus 500, you know, a 20% increase, a 20% increase in speed to using six cores. That's nothing to brag about. So there's something like this is the example from the, that book, okay? And it's a good example for explaining the idea and the, uh, but I'm not sure why it's having such a bad, it's doing such a bad job of, of speed, of getting speed up. You know, the speed up is really mediocre. Okay, now let's see, we're, we're done. Okay, we've gone the hour and 15 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Keep reading about fork join. There's, you know, you've got uh, three sources of information about fork join. The, the example we've been doing is coming out of this handout here. Okay, the code we were just doing came out of this handout. Okay, and 
Then there's uh, a little bit about fork join back in this chapter four on modern concurrency, but it was only a, a couple pages. And there's two nice articles right here that explain a little bit about the work stealing and some other things. So, so uh, keep reading about fork join and then we'll do some more examples on, on Wednesday and we'll see if I can sort out, you know, maybe it's a tuning issue. Maybe we need to keep tuning Things like the cut off, the uh, the sequential cutoff, and uh, you know maybe the sequential cutoff is still too small here, you know, or you know, you know we, but we'll we'll see if we can figure out like what we're not getting very much speed up. So we're you know I'm try it at home, run this program on your machines at home. Like maybe the problem is because I'm my background, maybe there's too much background noise in my machine. Maybe having uh, Zoom running in the background is, is screwing up our numbers too much. So you guys should play around with it. The code is, you know, the, the code is here. There's a, uh, there's a sum array example, a sum of squares example. Then there's an example that finds the max of an array. If you, here's the batch file that lets you run it using a huge heap. So if you, if you take any one of these examples and give it a huge array, you'll need a bigger heap. So then you need to use that batch file. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions? No. Okay. Is this the audio? Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and end the. I'll go ahead and end it. And if you have questions, send me an email. You know, or if you want, you can. Uh, uh, you know, ask me to, to talk with you over Zoom, but uh, yeah. so just if you have questions, let me know. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to see if I, how to figure to do this. Stop sharing. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting now. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you, Professor. Bye. Bye. Bye.